Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation, our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our Heritage.org website. Several will be joining us on C-SPAN today. Those who are watching online are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Uh, those in-house are asked to make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. And of course, our internet and online viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments to speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our discussion today is Elizabeth Slattery. Mrs. Slattery is our senior legal policy analyst in the Edwin Meese Theory Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Her research focuses on issues such as the scope of the Constitution's Commerce Clause, Equal Protection, Federal Exemption, and Election Laws. She also studies and writes about the Supreme Court, judicial confirmations, the proper role of the courts, and methods of judicial interpretation. In addition to her research work, she is regularly contributes to the Rule of Law posts on Heritage Policy blog. Her work also has appeared in such venues as the Daily Caller and U.S. News and World Report. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Elizabeth Slatterly. Elizabeth. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Tomorrow morning, the Senate Judiciary Committee will hold a hearing on a proposed constitutional amendment that would give Congress the power to regulate uh, raising and spending of money in elections. Supporters of this proposal, such as Harry Reid and Chuck Schumer, along with 40 other senators, say that amending the Constitution is necessary to get so-called dark money out of politics and to stop billionaires like the Koch brothers from allegedly buying elections. They say money is not speech. But the Supreme Court has disagreed, and it's determined that bans on money are indeed bans on speech. In fact, anyone with practical experience in public advocacy and running campaigns knows that money is necessary to engage in effective political speech and activity. Here today, we have a panel of campaign finance experts to talk about this proposed constitutional amendment and its problems. In order to get to what they have to say, I'll keep their introductions brief. First, we'll hear from Bobby Birchfield. He's a partner at the law firm McDermott, Will, and Emery. Bobby is an experienced trial and appellate lawyer with expertise in complex corporate litigation and First Amendment litigation. On behalf of the Republican National Committee, he argued the challenge to the McCain-Feingold law in McConnell versus FEC before the Supreme Court. He also argued on behalf of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell in the successful challenge to aggregate contribution limits in uh, McCutcheon versus FEC, which was decided this past April. Bobby has argued almost two dozen appellate cases, appearing before several federal and state courts across the country. Bobby is a graduate of Wake Forest University and the George Washington University Law School, where he was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. He clerked for Judge Rogero Aldiser of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Next, we'll hear from Donald McGahn, who is the former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. During his time at the FEC, Don led what has been called a revolution in campaign finance, re rewriting virtually all of the FEC's procedures for audits and enforcement matters and advisory opinions. He's worked in private practice at McGannon Associates, Patton Boggs, and today he joined Jones Day's government regulation practice. Don also served as general counsel of the National Republican Congressional Committee for nearly 10 years. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and his writings have appeared in national publications, including Politico, Roll Call, The Hill, and The Washington Examiner. He has addressed members of Congress at several House retreats regarding congressional ethics and appeared numerous times on television, including on Fox News, PBS, and C-SPAN. Don is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, and he received his JD from Widener University School of Law. And last but not least, we'll hear from Hans von Spakovsky, who is a senior legal fellow here at Heritage, as well as the manager of Heritage's Election Law Reform Initiative. Hans writes on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, the First Amendment, immigration, and election integrity. He's also known within Heritage as the unofficial Inspector General of the Department of Justice, having written numerous articles about Attorney General Eric Holder and various divisions at DOJ. His book, Obama's Enforcer, about the Holder Justice Department, comes out later this month. Before joining Heritage, Han served as a member of the Federal Election Commission, and before that, he was counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Department of Justice. His writings have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, Politico, and Human Events, to name a few, and he regularly appears on Fox News, as well as other national and regional TV and radio outlets. Hans is a graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he received his JD <clears throat> from Vanderbilt University School of Law. <clears throat> 
and I'll turn it over to Bobby. Thank you, Elizabeth. We are here today to declare victory. At long last, the advocates of campaign finance restrictions are conceding that the restrictions on campaign speech that they want simply cannot be squared with the First Amendment. Although there is no chance that the proposed constitutional amendment will be approved and ratified, defenders of free and robust political debate should not let the significance of this moment pass. The self-styled reform community has conceded that their restrictions cannot be squared with the First Amendment. Victory. I wish it were so. This afternoon, I would like to make three basic points. First, the McCutcheon decision is plainly correct. As you know, the campaign finance regime contains two types of contribution limits. Base limits impose a dollar cap on the amount of money a contributor may give to a candidate per election or a political committee per year. For example, Congress has determined that the non-corrupting amount an individual may give to a federal candidate is $2,600 per election or $5,200 for a primary and general election. The aggregate limits impose a cap on the total amount of money a contributor may contribute to, to all candidates and all political committees in a two-year election cycle. For contributions to candidates, the aggregate limit is $48,600 per election cycle. Once a contributor gives $5,200 to nine candidates, he is at $46,800. He may give only $1,800 to all other candidates. If it is perfectly legal to give $5,200 to the first nine candidates, why is it a felony to give $1,801 to the tenth candidate? This makes no sense. Put simply, you can't corrupt candidate Smith, that tenth candidate, by having already given a legal contribution to candidate Jones, one of the first nine. The plain motivation for the aggregate limit is to equalize political speech. Few people can give more than a few, a few thousand dollars, so the aggregate limit keeps more generous donors from giving too much. Decades of Supreme Court precedent, however, make clear that the First Amendment prohibits schemes to level the playing field by keeping certain people from speaking too much. Defenders of the aggregate limit recognize that precedent would not allow them to defend the aggregate limit as a speech equalization measure. So they defended it as a measure to prevent circumvention of the base limits. Unscrupulous contributors, they said, will try to channel contributions through candidates and political committees to preferred candidates. This led them to rely upon what Justice Alito referred to at oral argument as speculative hypotheticals. Even Justice Breyer's dissenting opinion relies on three hypotheticals to suggest that an unscrupulous contributor will go to great lengths to evade the base limit if there is no aggregate limit. Two quick responses. Persons knowledgeable about the campaign finance laws and regulations, as many of you are, will quickly see that Justice Breyer's hypotheticals assume activity that is in violation of the Federal Election Commission's regulations. Moreover, even under the aggregate limits as they existed until they were struck down, contrib contributors could give the maximum amount of money to nine candidates. If contributors were able to channel excessive contributions through other candidates or political committees to a preferred candidate, there should be some evidence, one example in the last four decades, one would think, of this channeling in prior election cycles. Yet the government had no such evidence. First Amendment rights should not be res restricted based upon so much speculation. The aggregate limits made no sense, and the court correctly struck them down. My second point this afternoon is that McCutcheon, like Citizens United, did not really break new First Amendment ground. Rather, those decisions returned to established First Amendment principles after a decade of deviation. The McCutcheon decision is grounded on two such principles. First, speech equalization, or leveling the playing field, is offensive to the First Amendment. 
This precept is a cornerstone of Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. Buckley, in turn, relied on the landmark precedents of New York Times versus Sullivan in 1964 and Associated Press versus United States in 1945. This desire to equalize speech, to limit the speech of the wealthy so they cannot dominate the debate, is, I believe, a major purpose of campaign finance restrictions and a key motive, motivation of the effort to change the First Amendment. The second fundamental precept underlying McCutcheon is that avoiding corruption or the appearance of corruption are the only governmental interests recognized under the First Amendment for restricting political giving and spending. Moreover, in this context, corruption means quid pro quo corruption, the giving of money for political favors. Again, this press precept dates back decades. As the court wrote in 1985 in FEC versus National Conservative Political Action Committee, Quote, we held in Buckley and confirmed in Citizens Against Rent Control that preventing corruption or the appearance of corruption are the only legitimate and compelling interests thus far identified for restricting campaign finances. It continued, quote, the hallmark of corruption is the financial quid pro quo dollars for political favors. The court began to deviate from these principles in the late 1990s in the second Colorado Republican decision. A court majority began to expand this anti-corruption rationale to encompass war chest corruption, which means that an individual or a corporation had too much money. Access corruption, which means that by giving money you might be able to shake a senator's hand in a receiving line. And even gratitude corruption meaning that if you gave money to an to a office holder, they might be grateful for it. This deviation reached its peak in the McConnell decision in 2003, which upheld the sweeping restrictions on political speech in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act. Citizens United and McCutcheon have reversed this trend and returned First Amendment jurisprudence to its basic principles. Cries from the reform community about how the Roberts Court has ignored precedent and rewritten the First Amendment are simply mistaken. My third and final point today is that the self-styled reform community is trying to read into the First Amendment their own view of what democratic government should be. By its language, intention, and the precedent applying it, the First Amendment protects the marketplace of ideas, promoting the most robust discussion possible with the assumption that a free people can assess for themselves the strength of the arguments and make informed electoral decisions. This means that the government does not silence anyone, it does not limit anyone, and it does not referee the debate. In recent years, the self-styled reformers have begun to suggest that free and robust debate does not promote democracy, but threatens it. They contend that allowing the wealthy to spend more, speak more can drown out the voices of the less wealthy, and that the very volume of speech from certain quarters threatens to delegitimize, they would say corrupt, the democratic process. Justice Breyer's dissent in McCutcheon appears to adopt this argument. This is a very troubling argument, and those who cherish the First Amendment must push back strongly and vigilantly. This notion that the First Amendment imposes a duty to limit speech to protect democracy turns the free speech guarantee on its head. Other constitutional provisions protect the integrity of the political process, but the free speech clause of the First Amendment protects unfettered debate so those other provisions can work. This notion that too much speech is undermining democracy is also inaccurate on several levels. The rich do not advocate a single viewpoint. Think of Sheldon Adelson and George Soros. They don't agree on anything. There are strong voices on the left and on the right not just in privately funded campaign advertisements, but also in the broadcast and the print media. Only a small portion of those with significant resources even bother to participate in the debate. And among those of limited means, the portion is small indeed. In order to equalize debate among the haves and the have-nots, severe restrictions would be necessary. The quantity and quality of discourse would certainly suffer. Let's trust the public to listen carefully to the most robust debate possible and to make decisions based on more information, more debate, not less. There is, that has always been the, press, the premise of the First Amendment, 
and of American democracy. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I to thank uh, Heritage for having me here and putting on this panel. And I want to begin by echoing what Bobby said about declaring uh, victory. My, my reaction when I, when I heard that the Senate Democrats were going to push an amendment to the Constitution, changing the First Amendment, was at least now they're finally admitting that what they really want to do is unconstitutional. Um, for over two centuries, we've agreed that the idea of robust political discussion is necessary in a representative democracy such as ours. When you elect representatives to go to Washington or to your state capitals, you don't micromanage everything they do. You trust their judgment, but the way to ensure that their judgment remains somewhat pure and at least consistent with what the people want is that the people can speak out and criticize those folks once they get in office. That's kind of how we do things in America. I'm not sure how they do things outside of America, but I know here when you elect folks, you have to be able to criticize them. If you can't, well, then they lose touch with the people. But what we've seen recently is a real assault against this sort of approach. Uh, when the Citizens United opinion came down, um, there was first shock and disbelief in some parts of town. Others parts of town we were doing uh, dances and high fives. Um, but really what, be, what, what, what came about after that was really an amazing sight from President Obama during a State of the Union address making what I think was a, probably an unprecedented remark about a Supreme Court opinion, uh, claiming that the Citizens United opinion would usher in foreign national money and all sorts of other things that was simply, as Justice Alito mouthed at the time, not true. We know who was right and who was wrong in that. Um, second, we saw the IRS do, it, do what the IRS did asking all sorts of bizarre questions of people from what sort of books they read to what sort of prayer groups they went to and the like. Um, third, and this is one that sort of flashed on the scene and then disappeared, the Federal Communications Commission flirted with the idea of, of monitoring newsrooms just to check the balance. Remember that one? That sort of disappeared once people figured out what that was about. But, but let's not forget that because that seems to be the sort of thing that, well, in America we shouldn't be doing. And then now, the most recent is you have the majority leader of the Senate, Democrat Harry Reid, seeming to redefine the, the use of special order speeches and floor statements attacking various individuals, a couple in particular, uh, for speaking their mind, if nothing else. Um, it's really a bizarre time in which we live, and just when one thinks it couldn't get any, any, any more uh, peculiar, they are now pushing an amendment to the Constitution to essentially change the First Amendment. Um, and they're doing it smiling, and they seem to think that somehow uh, the wind is at their, at their back. Frankly, I think it's political theater. There's no chance of this becoming the law. Senate Democrats are in trouble. They know it. Any, any, any reputable political uh, uh, um, um, tracker will tell you this, whether it's Charlie Cook or Stu Rothenberg or any of the folks who rate races will tell you the Senate Democrats are slowly losing their grip on power. And I suppose desperate times call for desperate measures, so now they are, are attempting to amend the Constitution as part of their sort of grand, grandstanding to try to silence the, their, their critics. Um, and it's really a shame. But why do we have the First Amendment? What gets lost is that it's not there just because it, we needed a placeholder in the Bill of Rights. There's some history there as to why we have it. And it really goes back to when we were under the rule of England. And for about 100 years, England, England was, and, and to a certain extent still does, have an entirely different view of, of free speech than we, we have here. The licensing order of 1643, for example, um, essentially banned all sorts of public speech, newspapers, pamphlets, and the like, they had to be licensed. And of course, they had to be licensed by the Crown and then later Parliament. And the kind of speech they didn't like the most was the kind that the people liked the most, which was that critical of the Crown and the government of England. So what the government did was they simply said you had to license it, which is effectively a ban. So you had to register all print materials and the like. And there were some rather draconian provisions that were attached to this. You could be arrested, that sort of thing. Um, then, you know, it, it fast forward, the Stamp Act, remember this from, from, from uh, history class, 
That was in 1765. It had nothing to do with the sort of stamps that you put on mail pieces, but of course it had to do with the fact the Crown required that a stamp be placed in all printed materials. So in order to print anything in the colonies, one had to pay a tax. So you had to get permission to speak yet again. We fought a revolutionary war over, over this concept, and as part of the deal of adopting the Constitution, we all know that there was a requirement that the Bill of Rights be adopted, and the first of which, which contains the freedom of speech and the freedom of press and the freedom of association, among others. Now, here we are in, in the midst of an election battle where certain politicians are gripping, gripping the power as, as only politicians can, and now they want to they change the rules of the game and prevent people from criticizing them, not unlike England did long before our revolution and which led to our, led, led to our revolution. So here we are, and what are they actually trying to do? Well, I have a copy of the, the proposed amendment in front of me. And it says, to advance the fundamental principle of equality for all, of, of political equality for all, and to protect the integrity of, of the legislative and electoral processes, Congress shall have the power to regulate the raising and spending of money and in-kind equivalents with respect to federal elections, including through the setting the limits on, one, the amount of contributions to candidates for nomination for election to or for election to federal office, and two, the amount of funds that may be spent by in support of or in opposition to such candidates. Section 2 extends this power to the states, which is even, I think, a more radical change because talk about federalizing elections. Uh, it empowers, uh, uh, it, 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 regardless of what a state constitution said, this would presumably trump that. So what does this mean? Well, first it invokes the fundamental principle of political equality, whatever that means, um, for all. But yet there's an exception to later in the proposed amendment that exempts out essentially uh, the corporate press. It says nothing, no, nothing, nothing uh, in this article shall be construed to grant Congress the power to abridge the freedom of the press. So in other words, that means if you are the incorporated media, which is really much like the mainstream media today, it seems that you are exempt from this. But if you're a blogger or, a, or, or someone who's maybe on the cusp of being the media, watch out. This seems to empower Congress to regulate you or otherwise uh, potentially ban you uh, from speaking. Um, what some of this means, who knows? And as one who has done nothing but election law for most of my professional career, I read this and I scratch my head and I wonder why they have to do this. Because when they want to pass an amendment that says Congress should have the power to regulate the raising and spending of money, Congress does have the power, rightly or wrongly, to, to regulate the raising of money. Buckley versus Vallejo upheld contribution limits. They've been upheld since. Limits that are too, long, too low have been deemed a, an abridgment of speech, but for the most part, courts have already upheld the ability to limit contributions. Uh, the government has flirted with banning, uh, with, with banning certain kinds of speech. Much of it is still banned if it's it is so-called coordination with candidates, which is subject to a, a murky multi-factor test. But they do have the power to do that, says the courts. Um, so the question is, what, what are they doing? Well, they're going to try to limit independent speech. Now, what's interesting is the courts have upheld some disclosure of independent speech, which six months ago was supposed to be the answer, a year ago was supposed to be the answer. Remember the Disclose Act, Part 1 and Part 2? Well, that was supposed to cure all the ills us in our, in, our, in our democracy, but unfortunately, I guess they've given up on that and they've moved to the more radical change, which is the constitutional amendment. So when you read this text, you think what the courts have already upheld, what are they really getting at? Well, they're getting at the kind of TV advertising we're seeing nowadays, criticizing, well, frankly, the Senate Democrats for what they've been doing. Now, the question is, why can't we do this now under current law? Well, what's amazing is that many of the ads that people are currently complaining of are not covered by current law, nor have they ever been covered by current law. Unless ads contain express words of advocacy this time of year, you don't have to even file a disclosure report, which is as it should be. If you're near an election, McCain-Feingold imposed an additional reporting requirement for so-called electioneering communications. But the sort of ads we've seen for the past year and a half are not election ads. They're issue ads. They are speech designed to influence the official acts of politicians, which is precisely the sort of speech that's at the heart of the First Amendment. So with that, I have a few questions for the sponsors of this see if they can answer these questions. Maybe they'll answer them in the hearing tomorrow. Chances are probably not. They had a hearing several weeks ago, uh, which was supposed to be sort of a campaign finance hearing, and uh, at the last minute they added uh, retired Justice John Paul Stevens to the witness list, and they started talking about amending the Constitution. I testified in the second panel and was talking about how really the party committees have been marginalized by McCain-Feingold and 
had a million great examples. If anyone would have bothered to ask me any questions from the Democratic side, I could have told them all about it. But they didn't ask me a single question. Instead, they were more interested in talking about amending the Constitution. But here are some questions. First, under this amendment regulating uh, electoral processes, integrity of uh, legislative and electoral processes, could Congress prohibit a labor union from communicating with its members if that communication somehow affected the legislative or campaign process? I would think the answer is yes. What about other membership organizations, the NRA, Sierra Club, that sort of thing? Could Congress ban communications between those, those, those groups and their members regarding politics? Seems to be what this may permit Congress to do. Can it be speech selective? Doesn't say anything about, about the, the, it doesn't have the clarity of the current First Amendment, Congress shall make no law. It talks about political equality for all. Well, when you read, as, as, as Bobby Birchfield mentioned, the dissent in McCutcheon, it seems that, it seems that political speech equality means you can, you can ban some speech and not other speech. It seems far-fetched that somehow speech equality could lead to some people being banned and not being banned. Think, ba think back into our recent history. When the Federal Election Commission considered Fahrenheit 9-11, Michael Moore's movie, which was none too flattering of President Bush, the FEC said that was fine because it was a commercial movie for profit, uh, and so that was not prohibited. But when David Bossie and Citizens United came into the Federal Election Commission and asked about Hillary the movie, the FEC said, nope, sorry, that's banned. I cannot for the life of me tell the difference between the two movies ex except for the fact one says bad things about George Bush, a Republican, the other says bad things about Hillary Clinton, a Democrat. So if you say bad things about the Republican, you can, you, 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 you're fine. If you say bad things about a Democrat, perhaps you're going to be banned. What about pastors and churches? This is an issue that comes up every so often. Can the government now get in there and tell a priest he can't talk to his congregation because it may somehow have something to do with politics? This amendment would seem to permit the U.S. Congress to do that. And what about bloggers? What if you're not the corporate media? What if you're Citizens United? What if you're other companies trying to make movies and documentaries of the sort that the, that the corporate mainstream media deem not to be part of the exclusive club that they are, are already in? Can Congress then regulate or otherwise ban those movies? We've seen it with the Citizens United movie. Let's not forget the facts of that case. Notwithstanding the hyperbolic press coverage, it was about a film and whether it could be seen and, and bought on pay-per-view cable by adults in the privacy of their own home. And the Federal Election Commission and later the Solicitor General's office said no. McCain-Feingold says you cannot watch that movie in the privacy of your own home on pay-per-view cable. That was the facts. That went to the Supreme Court. So this is not a situation where we're talking about, well, we're just going to ban campaign stuff. We're talking banning movies here. Um, and then what about books and movies generally? What if a book is a 500-word book that talks about public policy, but it does get into election speech and says, therefore, you shouldn't elect so-and-so to be president? Does this amendment empower the government to ban that book? I'm afraid it does, and this is why this needs to die a very, a very sudden death uh, so that we can continue to criticize our elected officials as we must in a representative democracy. Thank you. Well, maybe I should just sit down since I think they've, uh, Don and Bobby said everything they need to say about this, but I'll, I'll, add, a, I'll add a few words. Now, up, uh, the slide that we put up is basically uh, the constitutional amendment, the important parts of it. And you'll notice that, uh, as, as Don said, it not only would limit, uh, give Congress the power to limit the contributions that can be given to a candidate directly, and also the expenditures that a candidate could uh, incur trying to run for office. But you'll notice it also says that it would uh, give them the power to limit the amount of funds spent by in support of or in opposition to candidates. What that means is that it would give Congress the power to limit independent spending by individual Americans. Now, if you think that Congress would never do such a thing, I should tell you that, in fact, in the early 1970s, when, when Congress passed the modern version of the uh, campaign finance laws that we've operated under now for 30 years, um, they actually passed a ban on independent expenditures 
by uh, organizations and individual Americans uh, limiting them to only $1,000. Now, that meant that if you, as an individual, didn't like somebody running for Congress in your particular state, and you wanted to take out an ad in your local newspaper, all on your own, no coordination with any other candidate, uh, to say to try to convince your neighbors not to vote for that particular candidate, you couldn't spend more than a thousand dollars doing that. So Congress already tried to do this in the early 1970s. Now, fortunately, in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision, which is the seminal case on campaign finance law, that was in 1976. That's the that's the case in which the Supreme Court uh, came up with the standard it uses in this area, which is to say. Uh, that laws that uh, prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption will be considered acceptable uh, and, and can be used to somewhat limit first, uh, otherwise uh, accepted First Amendment rights. In that case, fortunately, the Supreme Court threw out that $1,000 limitation on independent expenditures. But it shows you the kind of ideas Congress had previously about this. And if this amendment were to pass, it could impose a law like that immediately, and there is nothing that anyone could do to stop it. And in fact, if Congress said, well, I really think $1,000 is too much for anyone to spend on, uh, independently on this kind of political speech, you know, they could uh, crank that down to $500, to $100, to $5, and there is nothing that anyone could do to challenge it because they would have changed the First Amendment to do that. Now, the supporters of this amendment, all 41 of them, and I have to tell you, I find it absolutely shocking that almost half of the United States Senate would, for the first time in American history, support something that would roll back part of the Bill of Rights, something unprecedented. This never happened in this country. Uh, they say that, well, you know, when you restrict the amount of money that, that individuals can spend, raise or spend, that's not the same as restricting free speech. Well, as the Supreme Court said in that Buckley decision 30 years ago, uh, virtually every means of communicating ideas in today's mass society requires the expenditure of money. You know, from the humblest handbill to leaflets, to political ads run during prime time on TV, radio, and other mass media, to putting up billboards, putting up yard signs, or in the modern internet age, putting up a website. All of that costs money. And you know the days when you could uh, stand on a soapbox in the Boston Common and speak politically to get people to accept your ideas or to vote for you as a candidate are long gone. And frankly, even then, if you want to be effective, it costs money. And again, those who say, well, the framers never imagined that the First Amendment would protect uh, money spent on political speech, political activity, well, excuse me, but one of the greatest works uh, in America that helped spur our revolution, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, it cost money to write it, publish it, print it, and distribute it. And the Federalist Papers, which helped get our Constitution accepted by the states, were printed in broadsheets, which were the equivalent of newspapers at that time, all of which cost money. So the idea that if you restrict money, you're not restricting free speech is just ridiculous. That's, that's the same thing as saying that if you restrict the amount of money that a newspaper comp corporation like the New York Times can spend buying newsprint, you're not restricting their free speech. I mean, that, that is just a ridiculous claim. Now, this case, as we have talked about, wouldn't just overturn the Citizens United decision and the McCutcheon case, but as we said, it would overturn the Buckley decision, the case from 30 years ago, because it would also overturn what the Supreme Court said in that case about expenditure limits. What a lot of people don't realize is that back in the 1970s, Congress didn't just pass contribution limits. You know, that's what we've lived under now for 30 years. Back then, they limited the amount you could give to a congressional candidate to $1,000. It stayed that way for 30 years. It was raised to $2,000 in 2002 and then indexed to inflation. 
But at the same time, back uh, in the early 1970s, Congress at that time also put in an expenditure limitation. They said that people running for Congress and for president would be only be able to spend a certain amount of money to run for office. Now, the Supreme Court threw that out because they said, look, that is a direct limitation on your First Amendment rights. Because when you limit the amount of money that a candidate can spend, you are directly limiting their speech. You're limiting the amount of brochures they can send out, the amount of ads they can do. Uh, you're limiting their ability to rent a hall and go speak live in person to voters. And so they threw that out. Well, this amendment would get rid of that limitation that the Supreme Court came up with. And once again, uh, Congress could actually pass a law limiting how much you spend. Now, for those of you who think that's a good idea, I would remind you that once Congress put the contribution limits in, in the early 1970s, uh, you can look at a graph of the incumbency rate of members of Congress, and that line will be like this. It just goes steadily up. And why is that? It's because limits on contributions help incumbents. It's very tough for a challenger to take out a sitting member of Congress. They don't have the name recognition. They don't have the contacts. It costs a lot of money to knock out a challenger. And when you put on limits on contributions, you're making it much easier for incumbents to stay in office. And if you put in limits on expenditures, which, as we've shown by history, Congress has already demonstrated it wanted to do, uh, you would be making it even tougher for challengers to come in and knock off uh, members of Congress. And I will tell you that I don't think it's a, just a coincidence uh, that in two, January 2010, remember, that's when the Citizens United decision was decided, and what happened in November of 2010? In November 2010, we had the most uh, challenging uh, congressional races since the 1930s. And that is because directly of the Citizens United decision and the fact that suddenly there was independent political expenditures, uh, the ban on that uh, had come out. Now, I want to talk about something else that was very possible, and um, Don just br briefly mentioned this. But again, this shows what Congress could do, could do if this amendment were passed. Um, you know, the Citizens United decision, th there was something unusual in that, and that was that there were two oral arguments before the Supreme Court, not just one, as is usually the case. And at the first oral argument that I attended, uh, Chief Justice Roberts asked a hypothetical question of the government. And the hypothetical question was, uh, it concerned the electioneering communications provision. This was a provision that uh, the, the Congress had passed in 2002 that limited and banned the ability to run any kind of radio or TV ad uh, 30 days before a primary and 60 days before a general election that named a candidate for federal office. Now, the problem with that ban was that uh, you could be running an ad, you could be the Sierra Club, and you could be running a political ad about uh, a bill that was going to be voted on by Congress on October 15th, uh, had, had to do with the environment. And if you named a congressman who was running for office, if you simply told voters, look, this is an important bill coming up, please call Congressman Smith and tell them to vote against this bill you would be breaking the law if that congressman was up for election in November, even though your ad said absolutely nothing about uh, the, 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 the congressman from, the ter in, from terms of voting for or against them in the upcoming election. That's the provision that's one of the provisions the Supreme Court threw out. But remember now, that, that provision only extended to radio and TV ads. Well, the, the Chief Justice asked the government, uh, well, if we uphold this provision, um, could it be extended to books by the government? You know, he posed a hypothetical of a 500-page book that discusses the American political system, and at the end says, and so vote for X. Could the government ban that? And the answer given by the Assistant Solicitor General of the United States was, yes, we could prohibit the publication of a book. I, I just find it amazing that the Solicitor General's Office of the United States would give such an answer that they think there's nothing wrong with banning books 
and the United States of America. Now, some will say that there's too much money in politics, and the intent of this is to get money out of politics. I, I always kind of have to laugh at that. Uh, I, I looked this up before I came down here. You know, in 2013, uh, American companies spent over $140 billion advertising their products and services across the United States. Uh, if you check several of the websites that total up uh, political spending, you'll find in the 2012 election cycle, uh, we spent about uh, $6 billion total on elections. Uh, that's about the same as American companies spent advertising fast food and candy in the United States last year. So this idea that we're spending too much money and that restricting it is the right way to go uh, when we have such a great First Amendment that believes in um, uh, increasing debate in this country, I, I think is just wrong. Um, you know, the more political speech we have, the better. And again, I just have to say I'm shocked at the idea that Congress, uh, members of Congress would be in favor of restricting the First Amendment. Uh, th these are all very complicated legal issues, but I want to all boil it down to this, because this is what this amendment would allow if it was passed. Uh, many of you may know that uh, the Federal Election Commission, where Don and I both served, does impose civil penalties on individuals who uh, violate federal campaign finance laws. But if you knowingly and intentionally violate the law, you can be prosecuted criminally by the U.S. Department of Justice and you can go to prison for up to five years. What a lot of people seem to forget was that David Bossie, who was the president of Citizens United, um, because of the fact that after the FEC told Citizens United it was not allowed to advertise for this documentary it had made about Hillary Clinton, because they, if they had gone ahead with it after he had been advised that he can't do it, that would have been considered an intentionally annoying violation of the law, and he could have gone to federal prison for five years if he'd been prosecuted by the Justice Department. Why? Because he made a movie. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a country in which Congress has the authority to pass a law that would put someone in jail for making a movie or political documentary, writing a book, sending out a voter guide, publishing a pamphlet, or taking out a political ad. Or because a candidate spends $100 more than some artificial expenditure limit that the incumbents in Congress put in to limit the amount of spending of anybody who wants to try to throw them out of office. I think this violates some of the most basic tenets of freedom and liberty on which this country was founded and the, that the Bill of Rights was intended to protect. Uh, it's certainly not, as I said, the kind of country I want to live in. Thanks. Oh, and I should say, uh, we hit one, one more thing I almost forgot. Uh, I just think that there was an amendment that Heritage would like to propose, a new amendment that, that Heritage would like to propose. You'll see that it's actually funny. It's exactly like the current First Amendment that we have. So we'll open it up for questions uh, from the audience in just a minute. But uh, first, we have three ground rules. Wait for the mi microphone. Please state your name and your affiliation and ask a question, don't make a speech. So are there any questions? Okay, oh, down here. <clears throat> what do you think is the real motivation here for the left promoting this? It may be that this is popular or it may be that this will turn out to be a huge popular mistake. Uh, and do you see any way that, given the fact that now 22 or 23 states have called for an Article 5 uh, convention for a balanced budget, that the left might be hoping that a convention occurs that they can then turn into a runaway convention that they can then use to propose this amendment? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, Ramon, um, I, think, I think it's being driven by two things. First is pure politics. Second, I think, which is the more scary of the two, some of these guys actually believe that this is what we should do. As I, as I mentioned in my comments, it is an election year. 
election years cause people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. And we certainly see a certain drumbeat being, being uh, instigated by the Democrats um, to try to taint uh, various messengers and messages. Uh, and I think this fits hand in glove uh, with that. I think it's also designed to intimidate and silence people who are criticizing them. Um, this is nothing. This is nothing new, in the, to the extent that we've seen governments do this throughout our history. Uh, we just really haven't seen our government do it in our at least our recent history, notwithstanding efforts to limit that have been struck by the Supreme Court. The idea of, of such targeted um, efforts, I think, are, are unprecedented. But two, I think, I think some of them believe it. Um, you know, Judge Judge Bohr called it radical egalitarianism. And the idea of equality for the sake of equality, I don't think anyone's against equality, but the question is what's, what's equality? And when we see this play out, um, equality seems to have an Orwellian animal farm notion to it where some are more equal than others. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of what's, what's happening here. I think long term it's bad. It's bad for the people. It's good for the incumbents. Uh, um, and ultimately, it's, it's probably best for those who actually get to make these decisions. When one looks at the text of the amendment, um, I, I'm struck by who, who gets the police limits on campaign spending. We know from the, from the uh, federal taxpayer-funded presidential elections that the FEC used to employ all sorts of people and do all sorts of mandatory audits. I mean, one can imagine like a mandatory audit of every federal campaign in America. I was at the FEC several years. I've said this before. Most people there, I think, play it straight, but there are people who certainly don't. Recently, there was a person at the FEC who was, had to resign for a, a rather blatant violations of the Hatch Act, overtly campaigning for Obama and against Romney. This is someone in the FEC enforcement division, says the press. Um, so the idea that you're going to have some neutral decision maker over these things is, is I think, fallacy. Same with the, the carve out for the freedom of the press. Who gets to decide who's the press and who's not the press? A bunch of elected bureaucrats at the FEC. I mean, imagine, imagine having to go into the Department of Motor Vehicles and, and convince them that you're really the media. Do you really want faceless bureaucrats doing that? Now, I understand the Department of Motor Vehicles has come a long way in D.C. and Virginia. I don't <laughs> want to cast any aspersions on anyone there personally, but you know, it's a convenient scapegoat. Um, as far as the runaway, as far as a convention, I mean, maybe, but I think that takes a little bit uh, of long-term thinking of the sort that we're not seeing right now. I think what we see is a strategy between now and November, and I think what you see are incumbents uh, desperately clinging to power. Hans or Bobby, do you, either of you have something you want to add? Let me add just a couple of quick points. We're dealing here with a, with a well-established powerful and well-funded constituency that has for two or three decades advocated increasingly severe restrictions on campaign finance reform, uh, on campaign finances. Now, interestingly, one of their big issues is this so-called dark money issue. Well, where do they get their money? None of these groups that are advocating for increasing disclosure and increasing restrictions on, on, on campaign finance disclose their donors. We, we think we know where the money's coming from, but they don't disclose it. So there's a bit of hypocrisy there, but there's also, there's also a strong constituency for increasingly severe restrictions on political, on political speech. As for the Constitutional Convention, I think, that, I think that, is a, that is a concern, but I do not detect a great public groundswell for these sorts of restrictions, and I think most people in this country understand that the purpose of the First Amendment is to promote free and robust debate. The American public seems to like that, and I, I, would, be, I would be a little bit surprised to see, if, to see a constitutional convention go down that track, but it's a possibility. My name is Sarah Stranahan, and I work for Free Speech for People, and I wanted to ask two questions. First of all, I think there's a perception that spending on campaigns, both in direct contributions and in independent expenditures, has increased dramatically since um, Buckley v. Vallejo and Citizens United, and I'm wondering if you can attest to the accuracy of that perception. And then I'm also wondering um, whether you're aware of any public opinion polls about Citizens United and McCutcheon and 
what your sense is of how the public feels about the current campaign finance rules. I'll go first. Um, taking them in reverse order, I'm not aware of any recent polls. I've seen news coverage of polls, and they all universally say no one likes Citizens United. Um, and then when I actually read the poll, I realize the question is skewed. Um, I do primarily campaigns for a living, so I like to think I can read polls, and, and I realize when you ask a question a certain way, you're going to get a certain answer. And when you ask the question, do you think mega international corporations should be able to buy U.S. elections? <laughs> and 80% of the people say, that's a bad idea. I wonder about the other 20%. <laughs> right? But if one were to ask the real question, should the federal government be able to ban a movie that that talks about a politician from pay-per-view cable so you can't watch it in the privacy of your own home, which is the facts of Citizens United, I think the poll should come out exactly the opposite of what most of the polls say. So, you know, it really, it, I always look for more of an informed question and not the sort of superficial question that talks about, you know, the James Bond bad guy behind the election kind of thing. Um, there's no, there's no, in absolute dollars, certainly spending has increased since Buckley versus Vallejo. Spending on everything in America has increased since Buckley versus Vallejo. At the time of Buckley, a brand new Ford Mustang cost about $3,500. Contribution limits imposed by Buckley were $1,000. If one were to convert the $1,000 limit to today's dollars, it's about $4,500. State parties are limited to accepting $10,000 of contributions. If one were to index that for inflation, you're up to about $48,000. Um, so spending, yes, has gone up, but the, but the way spending has, has changed, I think, is more the story. Um, candidates have really lost their ability to be the central voice in American democracy in large part because of the reform laws. Party committees used to be the natural ally to echo candidate voices. That's no longer the case. Money has moved away from candidates and, and parties to groups that are not as, not as transparent, not as accountable, and, and, and not as long-term. So yes, the total spending has gone up, but when one compare it to, compares it to other spending, Hans had a very interesting uh, approach. If you compare it to what other people spend on advertising for products, it's still a drop in the bucket. Um, I think ultimately it's not about the money, it's about what money buys. The cost of TV advertising has skyrocketed even over the past 10 years. It used to be you could get kind of a week of television in a house race for maybe 250 to 400 grand in a competitive house race. Now it's a million dollars a week. Postage has gone up, cost of phone calls has gone up, and the compliance costs have gone up. To make phone calls, political phone calls, require a ever-changing a uh, set of review processes to comply not only with federal law, but a never-shifting group of state laws. So everything has gotten more expensive, um, and, and the bottom line is even though spending has gone up unequivocally, there's still not enough money in politics to keep up with, with the actual information flow that I think voters deserve. Ultimately, the answer is more information for the voters, not less. It's unfortunate that takes money, but it does, and advertising costs a lot of it. I agree with all of that. I would I would add to, to Don's last point. This is this is the American democracy, the American electoral system that we're that we're speaking of. And to me, more debate, more speech, more more focus on the issues in television ads, in print ads, in public forums. That's a good thing. I don't think I don't think it's a bad thing that people are that people are airing a lot more television ads, and they certainly are because the restrictions, because of the First Amendment applications, have rolled them back. The second thing I would say is, uh, with regard to the polling, uh, it is true that, the, that, these, that these questions, and I've been on panels specifically to discuss polling, uh, the, the questions, whether, whether, whatever the results that, that result, whatever the results of the polls, the questions are almost always slanted one way or the other. Uh, I haven't seen a question that fairly presents the issue, in, in my view. They can be complex issues, they're difficult to, to, to phrase in a one-sentence in a one poll question. But even if 85% of the American public wanted to impose tighter restrictions on campaign, on campaign speech, that's what the First Amendment prevents. 
The First Amendment prevent, protects us from the tyranny of the majority. It protects the right of an individual person to say unpopular things. And, and that's, that's the spirit of American democracy, that's the tradition of American dem democracy, and I frankly think that's also a very good thing. Ken Doyle, with, uh, reporter with PNA. I'm curious about how you see this playing out in the Senate, the actual debate in the Senate, assuming Senator Reid brings up this amendment proposal. Will there be alternative proposals debated? Will it be just basically a straight up or down vote on this particular proposal? And would you predict it'll end up being just a party line vote, which would obviously be far short of the two thirds needed to pass it? Let me let me take a first shot. And just make and just make a couple of comments. I, I you know I I'm not sure how the politics of this play out. Actually, I think for for Democratic senators in close elections going on record as trying to change the First Amendment might not be such a popular vote. I could see, I could see a real bolt from the majority leader on this issue. Now, he may, he may have enough votes to keep his, he may have the power to keep his caucus in line on this, <clears throat> but to me it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to have all the members of the Democratic caucus stand up and vote uh, party line on this, that, that, that changing the First Amendment is a good thing. Yeah, and I, I would say and uh, something that tells you, uh, gives you kind of an indication of this, I think, is the fact that I, I think the administration really miscalculated recently when it got the IRS to propose new regulations for 501c4 organizations. Those, those are the advocacy organizations that are used, uh, you know, the, the NRA, the Sierra Club, they're all 501c4s. And, you know, the administration proposed these new regulations that would have severely restricted the political speech and activity of these organizations. The IRS was overwhelmed with public comments in the negative. They got over 150,000 comments. That's more comments for that one proposed regulation than all the other regulations the Treasury and IRS have proposed in the last seven years. And they were overwhelmingly against this change that, that I think they, they thought would be, would be popular. And as a result, you know, the IRS has backed off and said, oh, we're not going to put out these regulations this, this year. We have to take into account all these, these comments on it. But I think that's an, an indication of how uh, they have miscalculated on, on this issue. Hi, my name is Arielle Giordano. I'm a rising 3L at the Columbus School of Law at Catholic University, and I'm a law clerk for the Senate Judiciary. Um, according to Citizens United, laws that interfere with any type of political speech are subjected to strict scrutiny, and the government needs to prove that the, re that the restriction furthers a compelling interest and that it's narrowly tailored. According to this amendment, the specific wording is to advance the fundamental principle of political equality. Besides that specific wording, has Senator Udall or any of the Dems showed any type of narrowly tailored, compelling government interest to justify this amendment? No. no. <laughs> I think that's that. kind of the point of the amendment, right? right? I mean, what they're, what they're trying to do is, 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 is end run the idea of strict scrutiny, which, with all due respect to the court from years ago, was kind of made up in the first instance, right? I mean, the amendment says what it says, but yet Congress shall make no law actually means Congress shall make no law unless there's a compelling government interest that's narrowly tailored. But you, re you do raise a very interesting question that's a sort of a subset of your question, the idea that the political equality for all. This is sort of a new principle being interjected here in the world of speech. And it is, is that language that, that, that would empower Congress in and of itself? Is that some principle that the court <coughs> would use down the road to so-called level the playing field? Who knows? But what is clear is the Senate D's, Udall, and others have not to my knowledge, present anything in the, in the lines of analysis on this. This seems to be completely developed for the newspapers and the sound bites. And maybe there's some white paper I haven't seen, but I, I doubt it exists. And I think that notion of political equality goes back to the point I made when I was speaking about this notion that there's, there are democratic process limits on the First Amendment and that in some instances the First Amendment should actually be used to suppress speech rather than to promote speech. Uh, you, you, that, that's, that's a troubling concept, and you see some notions of that work their way into Justice Breyer's dissent in the, in the McCutcheon case.
We have time for one more. Hi, I'm Chris Fallon with Senator Hatch's office. Mr. McGann, you mentioned that um, as it reads now, it could limit um, communications between a group and its members. Could you say more about that? I'm not sure I see that. Um, uh, under, under current law, and even pr prior to Citizens United, when corporations were banned from sponsoring certain political communications, both corporations and labor unions were exempted to varying degrees when it came to those identical communications if they were sent to what's known as the restricted class. So if I were to pub if I were of Corporation X or Union X and I decided to run an ad that said vote against Senator so and so, if I published that publicly prior to Citizens United, that would have been illegal. But if I sent that message to the restricted class, which in the case of a union is its members, case of a corporation is its administrative and executive personnel, their families and stockholders, that was exempted. And I think that was driven by not just the speech concern, but the associational concern that's also guaranteed by the First Amendment. So when one um, empowers Congress uh, to, to in, in the name of political equality for all, and to protect the integrity of the legislative and electoral processes. So this is not just electoral, this is also legislative advocacy. And it expressly empower Congress to regulate the raising and spending money and in-kind equivalents with respect to federal elections. I don't see how you can read this anyway other than to say Congress would have the power to limit the ability of a labor union to talk to its members about politics or any other membership organization. And speaking of the politics, one could imagine, you know, I have a field day writing TV copy on this, the idea that Democrat voted to, to, to basically uh, empower the government or otherwise prohibit the union from organizing, that kind of thing. Very dangerous vote. But my, my point is, I don't know what this means, but I'm looking at it compared to current law. It must change current law somehow. So not only does it reach necessarily the independent ads that, every, that, that Democrats are really annoyed about right now, but I think it really does get at all sorts of other political activity that we've taken for granted for years. That are, it, we, don't, we don't do simply because of the benevolence of Congress. We do because of the First Amendment. But here, that's going to change. Well, to thank our two outside speakers, we have a heritage tie for both of them. Oh, Please join me in oh, thanking thank our you. panel. And thank you all for coming.